Good morning, Covenant Church. Good to see you this morning. Are we happy to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. God is good. God is good. You may be seated. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm so excited to continue this great series called Battles, The Invisible Beginning to Winning. We know we've read the back of the book and we know that we win, but we don't see in everyday life when we are embattled, we don't necessarily see the victory that we're praying for and that we're standing for. And the enemy's busy, the devil is busy, and man, he is petty. Pastor Ryan last Sunday, he kicked off this series, but he really launched into spiritual warfare using the text and the story of Jesus and the three temptations. And you may think, What does that have to do with spiritual warfare? There weren't any armies, there weren't any swords, there weren't any arrows, but that is a better picture of what everyday battle looks like for you and I than some ethereal idea of something happening right over our heads. The enemy loves close combat. He likes to get up close and personal. And so with Jesus, it was, um, it was, There was no fighting, it was actually pretty civil. It was more like a conversation and a negotiation, Um, but it was a battle of wills. It was close combat, and that is our enemy's very favorite way to fight us. The three temptations of Jesus give us a look at the enemy's playbook, and how many of you wanna see how he works? When he works, well, that wasn't very effective hand raise right there. When he works, how he works, why he works, what he's working to accomplish. Don't you want to know that? Um, He spent eons studying you, even your DNA. He knows exactly what your strengths and your weaknesses are that have come down through the bloodline. And today, I really want to take us behind the veil and behind the scenes, open up the enemy's playbook and see what it is he's after. Because anytime you understand what territory an enemy is after, then you know there is a limited number of angles for the attack, right? So we're looking at warfare happening right now on our planet in the country of Ukraine, and we can see that it is all, the beeline for that territory is first to surround it, right, and then take the big cities. The enemy does that as well with us. He wants to surround us, not just in heavenly places, but in relationships, in in thoughts, in words, and in actions. So we know that when we look at the three temptations, we're looking at the enemy's playbook, and if we know we're looking at the enemy's playbook, we know that what he used against Jesus was his very best stuff, right? You think he'd be foolish enough to not use the very best weapons that he had formed against mankind on the Son of God? He had studied mankind for generations, and he said, I am going to target my attack through three temptations. And these three temptations I want to show you today were each one targeted toward one part of the being of who Jesus is. So because there's three temptations, we can see the three-part beings. We were created, the Bible says, in the image of God body, soul, and spirit, right? So he, he took dust from the ground and he breathed the breath of life, that is the spirit of God, into mankind. And I want to just dissect, if you will, with me today, the difference between the three parts of our being, body, soul, and spirit. In Hebrew, the word three means harmony or wholeness. But how many of you know that if you have three roommates sharing the same space, there's going to be some internal conflict, right? There's going to be a a battle of wills. There's going to be a a powerful um, force between those three entities living in one small space. So the three territories the enemy is after is our body, soul, and spirit, and The three temptations reveal these three territories our enemy wants. We know that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He can't kill our spirit, all right? But he can destroy and he can steal. So if he can't destroy somebody, then he will distract them. He'll do whatever he can in the temporary 
to limit and alter eternity, right? Because he can't alter eternity without affecting the temporary. And I believe temptation is the enemy's favorite tactic. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to get into cohabitation, diversion, evasion, um, all the ways that the enemy comes at us. But his very favorite one is temptation. And this is why we're spending two weeks on this. Because when we are tempted and we give in, we are co-signing to our own destruction. There, has, there doesn't even have to be a fight when we give him a permission slip. There doesn't have to be a fight when we give him an open door and a key to the back door. He loves temptation. So let's look at, I need water. Let's look at our body. Let's look at that part of our being. What identity that we have comes from, thank you, honey, our body. <coughs> our physical strengths and weaknesses come from our body. Our DNA, what we get from grandma and great grandpa and comes all the way down. And the enemy has studied that. That's why the Bible relates to something called familiar spirits. They're familial. He studies what are the strengths in this family. In our family, I've seen through generations the strength of communication was also the area that he would create great tempta temptation to use our strength in the wrong way, using the arm of the flesh and not of the spirit, and then communication becomes destructive and not creative. The enemy, he seeks to study, okay, I know with this bloodline, this is the iniquity. The Bible calls iniquity. You know, years ago, we had these bushes in our house, and they were called knockout roses, and one of them got some kind of weird disease on it, and we had to remove it. Well, they'd all been planted right there together, all three of them. When we removed one, though, the other two were flat on one side. Why? Because they had all grown up together. So the two that remained were bent to the side. Do you know that's the root word of the word in Hebrew for iniquity? The word iniquity means bent. So your, your soul and your spirit have developed as you've grown right upside your body. So each of the three are bent. And when your body has iniquity, it means a bent towards sin. It doesn't mean you are born and you make a sin the second you cry, but it does mean you have a tendency. They've even scientifically proven that certain things like the breast cancer gene, etc., is passed down through your DNA. That is iniquity. They even say with sickness like breast cancer that DNA, you know, is loads the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. It's always there, laying there dormant, right? That, that bent towards something. So it's the same with, with attitude problems. It's the same with um, inequities. It's the same with strength. Certain, certain body parts you may have that are stronger than others. Our body encapsulates our DNA, our inherited strengths and weaknesses. Also, what I want to point out to you is on our body is we also have a brain and a heart. Now, it's not, when we talk about the heart in the Bible, we'll get to that in a minute, it's not the physical heart it's referring to. So our physical heart that pumps in our chest is part of our body. Our brain is a part of our body. But then we move to the soul, and I want you to see how these overlap to create who you are uniquely. So our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions, our motivation, our heart, the heart that the Bible talks about when it says giving your heart to God, that is the mind that we give to God. Did you know that? The heart you give to God is your mind. Your mind is not your brain. Your brain is physical. Your mind is, is emotional. Your mind is your filters. It is your motivation. It is your soul. You know, our body doesn't live forever. We know that. So one of the weaknesses of our body is that it will die. There is an expiration date. Our soul is the battleground that is up for grabs. Our soul is corruptible. It may die. 
If our spirit is not empowered, the best parts of your soul, your personality, your, your motivation, your heart, your giving, your generosity, the things that may come natural to you, your gifts, your talents, those things can die when your body dies. Your spirit has the potential, though, to restore your soul to God. So when your spirit then comes into unity with the spirit of God through salvation, your soul then has an overlap where your spirit redeems all of the things that God gave you uniquely to you, your personality, your gifts, all of those things can be redeemed and restored to God through your lifetime. So more of you lives forever when you experience salvation. Are you learning anything today? Okay, because I know it can get a little murky. It's a gray area. And the, the word of God, when it uses the word soul, it, it, it's also the same word that it pulls the word mind and heart. So those three things go together. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. Now, I'll give you an example of how the body and the soul so overlap. Um, you know, I have done study before in the, the different zones of the brain, phrenology, where it talks about your, where your personality is located. Um, some of that started with my brother had a traumatic brain injury when he was 16 years old. So I learned a lot about where the injury was and what areas of his life would be affected by that. None of them were because he was completely healed. They said he wouldn't walk and he wouldn't talk, and he did. He walked out on the 12th day, and you know he can talk. Very well. And so I, I, I studied that phrenology looking at, okay, there, there's, a, there's an, an old book that I have from the late 1800s that it taught people to actually look at someone's face and they could tell the person what their personality was and what their giftings were, what they had an aptitude for. And it's where the saying highbrow and lowbrow comes from. Because the shape of your face and your skull can tell them the shape of your brain, right? Your brain is shaped on the inside just like. So if you're wider through the eyes, then they could say, okay, we know they're creative. There are things like that, all right? So um, the brain, which is physical, houses the ca capacity for personality. Then the soul has the gifts, the talents, the aptitude, the desires, right? The motivation, the filters. And when those two things come together, then you have personality. Personality isn't just physical and it's not just soul. It's a combination of the two. You know people that personalities have changed when they've gone through certain things in their life, right? Okay, so the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions, the motivation, and the heart. Now let's look at the spirit. This is the third part of our being. This is the part of our being that was with God before we were born here on earth. This is the part that's God breathed, God connected. When I think about body, soul, and spirit, I think the easiest analogy to give you in the modern age for these three things is your computer. The hardware of your computer is like your body. The software on your computer is like your soul. It can be rewritten. It can be restored. It can be corrupted, right? It can, you have viruses. You have bugs, but you can restore that. But your, your spirit is like Wi-Fi. Your spirit is a connection that can get you information from somewhere very far away just like that. But you need a good connection, right? So you understand that. When our spirit then that was made by God, your spirit is who you are for eternity. It is who you are outside of your race. It is who you are outside of your gender. It is who you are outside of your nationality. It is who you really are. The world around us right now wants to identify us by all the things from the outside in. And we can, in the center of our identity, really take on those labels of gender, of race, of nationality, of age, of marital status, of sexual orientation, and that's who we want to say we are. But essentially, our spirit and our identification, our identity should come from the inside out, not from the outside in, because that is what lasts. That is eternal. It is not temporary, right? We don't want to be, be like those who build their house on the sand. 
So the spirit is the eternal part of you that is not limited by time or by space. Your spirit doesn't get in a hurry. Your spirit knows God. It knows things you don't know in your mind. It, it understands things you can't comprehend with your brain. It speaks the languages you have never learned. The Bible calls it, calls it, we can have tongues of angels. There's angelic understanding that your spirit has. It is a connection that too often we do not use or take advantage of that part of our being. More of us is spent living in what we call the flesh, which is the combination between the body and the soul. But without our spirit, we wouldn't be alive. Let's look at the three temptations and how each of these three territories were targeted by the enemy. The first one came in the form of a temptation because Jesus was hungry. So Satan showed up. Jesus didn't know that this was the enemy. He didn't identify him early on. And the enemy came compassionate, agreeing with his need. You're hungry. You haven't eaten for 40 days. Don't those Rocks just look just like a roll from, from Golden Corral <laughs> with butter all dripping down the side. Can't you visualize it, Jesus? I mean, use your spiritual position and pedigree to meet your physical need. The temptation was about his need, and the enemy will always come to you and I and agree with our need. The reason why he wants to do that is not because he's full of compassion, but because he wants to drive a wedge between you and God. God is provider. God is protector. See, you have a need, and God has not met this need. So use your spiritual position to pursue the fulfillment of this need. This is where the body of Christ can get off by preaching a prosperity gospel. I don't believe in prosperity gospel whatsoever. Do I believe that God has plans to prosper me? Yes, without a doubt. But it isn't so that my spirit can serve my flesh. I'm not supposed to gain a spiritual perspective so that I can command Cadillacs to show up in my driveway. The temptation could look like that's what God wants, but it's not. Anytime we ever put our spirit in servitude to our body, to our flesh, we've missed it. We have taken the bait, and Jesus didn't take the bait. In fact, he said, yeah, I'm hungry, but what you might have forgotten is that I chose this fast. I chose to put my body in its place, to put it in order. It's not the boss in this roommate situation. I'm putting my body where it belongs. And, and this is what he shows us the way he overcame that we can overcome. And I don't believe any of us could have overcome before his sacrifice. That's why he had to come. And I'll connect that with our spirit in just a moment. So the first temptation, the first target of temptation the enemy will start with you is to just get you back to the carnal desires. What are my cravings? What are my, what are my desires? Years ago, I remember my dad telling this, this story. It's so funny, but this, we called the church fast, and like the Daniel fast, and this man who had never done a fast before committed to do it, and the first morning of the first day of the fast, he got up and went through his normal routine and got in the shower, and he's like, man, this fasting's tough, and he's leaning against the shower and feels like he's going to pass out. He gets dressed and goes to work, and he has to sit down on the job, and he's telling everybody, I just don't feel good. He went home around lunch and said, this is, I must be detoxing or something. And when he began to pray, he told my dad later about this. He said, I began to pray, and it was like I felt the Holy Spirit laughing at me because I never even eat breakfast. <laughs> I never even eat until lunch. But yet, because I said I was going to fast, everything in my body told me, nope, 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 you can't do that. Why are you being so super spiritual? You don't need this. You didn't have a problem to begin with. Why are you even praying? We're all good. Just eat that, you know, donut. But this is the enemy. It is real territory. Our, our flesh, our body, it is really a playground for the enemy. 
and he wants us to live our lives. And sadly, so many opportunities are missed to live at a higher level. And our lives are destroyed because we just follow whatever whim our flesh has at the moment. And we end up starting over, over and over again because we follow the urges of our flesh. Jesus didn't do that, and he put the enemy in his place. He would not use his spirit to serve his flesh. The soul was the area and the territory of the second temptation. This was the battlefield that I find really interesting in regards to Jesus, because you know, we, we put Jesus in these beautiful paintings, and we think of him as perfect in every way in which he was. We'll read a scripture in a minute about he's tempted in all ways, but he did not sin. But he did have wounds. He did have emotional pain. So with the first temptation, the enemy always hits us with physical need. The second temptation, he will hit us. If physical need doesn't work, he moves up and the ante goes up with emotional pain. And when we look at the life of Jesus, you know, we see it through the lens of he's full of mercy and he's full of grace. But the Bible says that Jesus, even though his spirit was all God, and I want you to see this diagram so that you could see he could be all God and all man. His DNA was in the inherited weaknesses and strengths of generations. He had urges. He had desires. He had hunger. He had need. And he had a soul. And at this place of his soul as a young boy, the Bible says he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Jesus suffered emotional pain. And I want to take you and just, if we could just go into a little peek into Nazareth with Jesus as a little boy, being raised, feeling like, you know, I don't, I don't really feel like I look like my dad. I don't, I don't have the desire, you know, to be a carpenter the way that I should as the firstborn. You know how we can get a little bit of peek in to how the enemy could have really tormented him emotionally is we find Jesus at 12 years old when the whole family and the whole tribe, the caravan, made their way to Jerusalem to worship. Mary realizes when they're on their way back to Nazareth that Jesus is missing. She flips out, returns back to Jerusalem and is hunting, and the, the city has swelled to millions of people, and she's looking for him, and she's thinking, what does he have an aptitude for? What does he have desire for? Where could I find him? And she finds him reading the scripture in the synagogue and mesmerizing the rabbis with his questions. When she walks in and sees him, I'm sure as a mother, she's like, who do you think you are and what do you think you're doing? You know, I've been mad with, with anxiety. And he answers her and he says, wouldn't you know that I would be about my father's business? Well, his father in the natural, Joseph, his stepfather was a carpenter, not a rabbi. Jesus knew Joseph was not his father. And can you imagine as a young boy, him having to return home, having a desire for the scripture, wanting to know his real father with all his heart? but not having anybody near that could teach him like they could in Jerusalem. And yet he had to submit and surrender to his mother in obedience and return and serve under a father who was teaching him things he didn't have any desire to learn. Jesus had emotional pain. He had a father wound in the natural. The greatest father of all, but yet no one could see his dad show up to Little League games. Nobody could see his father show up and say, you know, look how proud I am of him. So this is what I want you to see is right before he goes into the wilderness, he's baptized by John the Baptist. And the Bible says that a voice, a booming voice comes and speaks to the multitude and says, God says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine that healing balm that would be? For him to know, I am vindicated. It's not just something I know inside now. I'm being validated and affirmed by my real dad. 
He just received that word. And then he goes into the wilderness and the first two temptations, the enemy embeds the question about his identity with the big word, if. If you really are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. If you really are the son of God, throw yourself down off this high wall. And the Bible says, Satan can quote scripture. He may know the Bible better than you and I. He uses it for his own gain and with his own filter. But in this text right here, he says to Jesus, you know, it's written that if you are the son of God, whoever the son of God is, could throw himself down and the angels would bear him up and they wouldn't even let your foot strike a stone. They would catch you before you fall. So if you're really the son of God, don't you want to prove that your father's household has your back? Don't you want to see whether your dad's going to show up for you? I know you want to see that. You and I both could bear witness right now if you just throw yourself down. But the temptation here was, it's not something I really relate to. I don't really think about jumping off of tall buildings. And, but I do jump to conclusions. I'm pretty good at that. When the enemy sets me up with an argument, and I have been picked on by the enemy lately, where he knows the playground of your soul and the emotional pain. He knows the embedded argument that he confirms over and over from this stranger and that stranger, that word of accusation. He knows it because he put it there. He knows emotional pain. And if you and I allow our feelings to rule our lives, we give our spirit over by preferring our soul and our pain. Sadly, I've seen through ministry many, many people, and I have in seasons of my, lives, of my life, dictated my decisions by my pain, my situation, my offense. And this is what's scary about the soul when we look at it like this, is that it has access to your memories, to your motives, to your experiences, and the enemy will use, he will align with your pain to create an argument against God. That's the territory he wants. He wants space. He wants to create distance between you and your creator. So let's look at the spirit and the third temptation. The third temptation hit Jesus in the point of spiritual struggle. The third temptation was this. He said to him, he took him up on a high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and he said, I'll give all of this to you. I know why you came to this planet, to redeem everything that's lost. I know you have a better way to organize things. I'll give all of it to you and you don't have to die for it. You don't have to bleed for it. All you have to do is bow for it. That's it, and I'll give it all to you. And what's interesting about this scenario is that the enemy will agree with what you know your spiritual purpose is. When you discover that purpose, when you find it, he will align himself with it and he will give you a temptation to take a shortcut, to bypass suffering. I'm gonna give you the outcome you want, but you won't have to bleed for it. I'm gonna give you a shortcut. How many times do we see people that ultimately end up in leadership and then we find out later they have cut so many corners to get there. No wonder they don't have character once they get there. They've never suffered anything. They've never had to make good decisions out of bad situations. They have bargained and negotiated for their authority. And what Jesus understood in that moment was the enemy's temptation is not to replace God's position in my life with him, but it's to replace God's will with my will. 
Because my will is I don't want to suffer. I want to fulfill God's will, but if I can do it without having to suffer, I'm going to choose that. The enemy just needs us. He doesn't need us to go into a cult and Satan worship. That's not what he's looking for. All he's looking for is for you to replace God, and he is fine with you replacing God if you put yourself on that throne. He has no problem with you replacing God's will with your own. That's what he did, in fact, and it shows that you're a follower of him when you do that because his desire was to put himself above God. So when you and I put our opinion above God, and this is something I see happen all the time. We really address this and deal with it at the retreat, the well that I just left yesterday. They're finishing up today. And it's a beautiful experience because what I've recognized throughout the years is that the enemy has access to your soul, your flesh, and your body and your soul can work together to betray your spirit until your spirit is pushed to the background. And this power struggle between your body and your soul will make decisions for you and create arguments and belief systems for you, even using the word of God, that will cause you to cut corners and to shrink back when God says move forward. I've seen this in my own life. I'm not really a tattoo person, but I have one. And the reason why I have this on my arm is because I needed to mark my flesh, not to glorify it, but to remember that my flesh is not my friend. And the reason why I came to very close understanding of this is because my brain, I got a good one. I inherited a good one. And I'm grateful for that. And my soul, the desires that I have, the motivations I have are for learning, are for information, are for input. So when I put those two things together, I enjoy spending, you know, two or three weeks on a message, on one message that's over in 45 minutes. I enjoy that. I love that. But that is still not my spirit. That is my body and my soul, right? Right? That's not what God is using because my spirit is surrendering and my spirit is surrendered to God. And when my spirit surrendered to God, my body and my soul are in servitude to my ultimate calling. But this is what I want to show you is my body and my soul don't like the lights and the stage and the attention. I don't like it. I'd rather be in a cave somewhere reading a book or writing a book. That is what my body wants. That's what my soul craves is, is, is solitary silence and peace. That is my iniquity. That is my bent. But listen to this. My flesh can sabotage my spiritual assignment because if my body says, Amy, you don't want to be criticized. You don't want haters online. You don't want to have to deal with people saying things against you. You know, have a nom de plume. Just come up with a writing name and say whatever it is you want to say. And you never have, you have a firewall. You don't have to deal with any of the opinions. You don't ever have to get up in front of a church and deal with a bunch of people who have offense and, and, and issues and pick on your shoes or whatever. Hide. And I recognize that the ability of, that my brain and my mind had, my mind collected all the information, all the script, scripture, all the knowledge that I have, and my flesh began to build a case against my spiritual assignment. It built a, a watertight theological case against being a female and standing up and doing what God called me to do. I had a whole theological dissertation on why I should shrink back. And one day the Holy Spirit said to me, Amy, you keep telling me you're a tree planted by rivers of living water. You're not a tree. You're an arrow. You are a weapon in my hand. And I keep telling you to go and to move forward and to say yes and you keep showing me this picture of you being a tree planted. One day, someone gave me this beautiful, my God name is Arrow. That's one of the things that comes out of the well is that we really pray and go, what does God call you? What is your assignment? And you hear for yourself. And when I was going through the teaching, um, before we even started the retreat, 
This is when this happened for me and the Holy Spirit said, Amy, you're a weapon in my hand. Stop showing me a tree. And I told that story and someone beautiful came to me and brought me this, this ancient arrow. It has the fletching, the feathers on the end, and it has an arrow head on the tip. But the whole body of the arrow is made from wood. And every time I kept telling God what my identity was, I'm like, I just want to research. I want to come up with great truths and I'll give them to other people to speak. But I want to be this tree, cozy, comfortable, safe, rooted. And I come up with all these scriptures. I'm rooted. I'm planted. You know, I'm not supposed to be moved. My leaves don't wither. And I'm preaching this back to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, when they give me this, this beautiful arrow, after I've declared that's who I was, the Holy Spirit said, look at what it's made out of. You're made of a tree, but you're not made to be a tree. I, I've shaped you, and I've called you to go forward. It's important how you see yourself. And when you look through the lens of your flesh, your body and your soul combined, your body and soul has access to all your experiences, all your information, and your body and soul doesn't want to have need that's unmet, and it doesn't want to have any pain. So any way around pain is what your body and soul will choose. And Jesus in that moment of empowerment said, I'm not going to give up my authority just to bypass the suffering. I will have to lay my life down. I will have to pay a price. And see, that kind of doctrine in the body of Christ that you don't have to suffer. What about the verses that say, you know, I were, I've been hated, you will be hated. If you follow me, you will suffer. Not because God orchestrates or intends for you to suffer. We are blessed beyond the curse, and that's the New Testament. But we, and we believe that but we still do have a battle. And the more effective we are, the more marked we are, the more anointed we are, the more called we are, the more we have the enemy at our doorstep trying to take the territory in advance of our victory. And he will do it through temptation. You know, I see this really effectively come across in the story of David. I love, love the Old Testament. And the story of David is, is one of my very favorites because there's so much from just the path to leadership and the trajectory of his circle of being anointed. He was anointed by Samuel the prophet when there was a king, Saul, already reigning. And Samuel said, this has to remain a secret because this is treason. Nobody can know I'm anointing the next king because Saul probably thinks it's gonna be his son. He goes to the house of Jesse and the Bible says that he calls all the sons of Jesse and seven of them show up. He looks each one of them in the eye and he says, no, not you, not you, not you, not you, not you. It's not you, it's not you. Who's missing? Do you have another child? And Jesse says, yeah, I do, but you know, he's, he's a boy and he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel says, well, we're not going to sit down for a feast until he's here. So everybody's going to stand until he gets here. David shows up with all his brothers glaring at him. Can you imagine? This is why later in the 23rd Psalm, when he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, he knew what that felt like. Because the greatest, most painful enemy that David ever faced was not Goliath, it was his brothers. That's the one that hurt. And what I want you to see is David encountered the very same three temptations that Jesus encountered. When David goes to take lunch to his brothers, he's been anointed already a couple years before and his brothers are, are all fighting with King Saul and they're standing at the, in the Valley of Elah where they're facing uh, Goliath and David shows up to the battle bringing lunch and he hears Goliath cursing them and he says, y'all are going to put up with this? Like, you're my big brothers. I've never seen you cower. What, what's going on? And his brothers look at him and they begin to uh, accuse him of being wicked. They say to David, your heart is so wicked. You've come here just to watch 
to make fun of us. And David, he just says, what did I say? What did I do to you? And then he responds and says, you know what? I'm gonna go talk to King Saul. And the word spreads and he gives Saul his resume and Saul mocks him and laughs at him and says, you know, try on my armor. Well, what we know about Saul is that he was head and shoulders taller than everyone else. So for David, this little kid to try on Saul's armor would have been comedic. Saul let him try it on because he wanted him to be measured against him. I want you to see, David, how inferior you are. But yet David, he didn't succumb to the temptation to argue with his brothers. He didn't succumb to the temptation to to, um, measure himself against someone else's standard and wear something he wasn't accustomed to. He said, no, I know what worked for me in the backfield. I'm gonna use that on this battlefield. He went out and faced Goliath. He took Goliath's head and we know the end of the story. But this is what I want you to see is that divine appointment of facing a giant for a kingdom It was not a personal cause, it was a corporate kingdom cause. That was a divine appointment, that was his assignment. But right before his appointment came his greatest disappointment. His brothers accusing him. If I were in that in David's shoes right then, I would have forgot about Goliath and said, "What? Are you kidding? Let's sit down. We got to we got to have a meal together and talk about why do you feel this way about me? What did I do to you?" Don't you understand though, when you're anointed by God, you don't have to do anything to anyone for them to see you as a threat. The enemy makes sure that he gets to you first to tell you, you're, 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 not, you're not worthy of even being here in this battle. It's close combat, emotional pain. And I want you to see how each temptation targeted Jesus at his weakest point, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Because if that's what the enemy used on Jesus, that's what he uses on you and I. And he uses it every single day. And he loves temptation because it gets us to sign on to our own destruction. There's no battle. There's no confrontation. We're inviting destruction in. Hebrews 4.15 says, for we do not have a high priest. This is talking about Jesus, and I love this so much. It says, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus is the mediator. He came and overcame these, these confrontations and conversations with the enemy so that he could show us how to overcome not just because we put our feet where he put his feet, not just because we make the same steps, but because when we surrender our will, our needs to his spirit, that means his spirit takes over. His authority comes in. Our spirit is empowered by the Holy Spirit when our flesh takes a back seat. See, the enemy's primary goal is to tempt us to invest in things that do not last, to trade the eternal for the temporary. That's his greatest, greatest tactic against you because he can't kill your spirit. Your spirit's gonna live forever. There's a time stamp on your body and what he knows is if he can get you to make every decision, every thought, every word, every action something you are trading in to meet a temporary need for yourself instead of putting your purpose to work for eternity, then when you die, you really die. And that's a very sad truth. I don't wanna spend my whole life building up some kind of legacy that moths can eat away, but I want my treasure to be in heavenly places. Do you? You wanna make decisions every day that impact eternity, not just temporary things. First Corinthians 15, 50 says, I tell you this brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. The three territories are the three battlegrounds where the temporary and eternal collide. And they do so many times throughout the day, every day in your life. We've started this series on spiritual warfare because 
our, our greatest desire as a body is to equip you and to empower you to overcome. But I could get your focus on hype messages to get you all excited about wielding a sword and a shield, and next week we'll go into the armor of God. But the only offensive weapon in the armor of God is the sword, which is the word of God. So there's nothing you have that can hurt the enemy. You don't have one weapon except surrender to use against him. And not surrender to him, but to surrender to the spirit. And the only way you are vulnerable, hear me now, the only way you are vulnerable to the enemy is if you are unaware that you are vulnerable. Once you recognize your body and your soul, your flesh can make you vulnerable to decay, to eternal loss, you'll change what you do. And we love this picture of this ethereal enemy that's somewhere over our heads, but more often he's invited into our lives through temptation. If he can get you through temptation, he doesn't need to bother with swords and with arrows. When he has a key to your front door and a hall pass to your heart, The greatest battle we will ever face is between our own flesh and our spirit. Because the only way God can fight our battle for us is if we give it to him to fight. If you keep trying to fight it for yourself, you will lose. Because every weapon you try to gather against the enemy cannot work against him. We cannot defeat an enemy we do not identify, and he has a playground, a battleground right in our own soul, in our heart, and in our mind. Galatians 5.17 says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these two are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to. I want you to see how the body and soul come together to create the flesh and they barricade the spirit to the background where our spirit is not a part of the equation. I feel like so many times when we're at a crossroads, I know I've done this, where I cross my arms and I'm like, okay, body, what do you need? Hear it out. Okay, soul, what do you have to say? My soul is all about, you know, oh, pout at them or you know, say this, because it'll make you feel better. My soul has a long list of things. And then I get to my spirit, and I'm like, what do you think, spirit? And the spirit's like, well, you need to repent. You need to forgive. You need to let go. You need to rise out of the ashes. You need to make a declaration that God is who he says he is. You need to begin speaking the word of God. And there are times when I'm so in my soul and I'm in my feelings and I'm like, spirit, why do you always come up with the worst suggestions? I don't want to do any of that. It's going to be painful. It will cost me. Yes, it will. But we only grow the spirit at the expense of the flesh. That's how it works. How do you empower your spirit? By disempowering your flesh. I know this is not a fun message, so I'm gonna smile really big. I want you to overcome. I don't want you to keep cycling through the very same mistakes that grandma and grandpa and Uncle Herb and everybody else has been doing all of your life. You can make a change. But when we try to fight the enemy on his own territory, It's his backyard. The flesh is familiar to him. You know, and this is what's important for you to understand is James 1.20 says, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I've seen this happen in my own life and, and unfortunately, I got to a place where I had to, I was praying for crop failure because I had planted some seeds I recognized in my soul that were bearing fruit of discontent, of of anxiety, of anger, because I thought it was all on me. And once I recognized where the enemy was getting a foothold, I began to start seeing that, how it's happening across the body of believers that I love so much, where the enemy, he's created these weapons of anger, of bitterness, of offense, 
And when we try to hang on to those things, thinking that one day we might find a use for those things, one day I might be able to say exactly what I always wanted to say. I'm going to be ready. If I run into them at Chili's, I'm going to be ready. I got my clap back. I know I'm not just talking to me, right? You know, you store up scenarios. This is the enemy's playground. And he knows this so well. You know, we're seeing this take place right now on our planet in the Ukraine where they've come under siege. And when a, a piece of territory comes under siege, it means that the enemy surrounds it and cuts off resources, right? So the goal is they're going to run out of food, they're going to run out of water, they're going to run out of gas, and we're going to keep them surrounded, and we will outlast them. That is the, that is the tactic, the military tactic of siege. So in ancient times, when a castle would come under siege, the stronghold with walls all around it, you know, in the story of Jericho, they shut it up tight and the people surrounded it. Well, when this would happen for long periods of time and they were tired, the battle was, you know, going on forever and the enemy that was camped around the city would get exhausted with it and they want to bring it to an end, they would do something called undermining. Within one of the tents, so no one peeking over the walls could see what they were doing, they would begin to dig underground a tunnel. They would go till they were all the way within the walls, and they would send in a small group of men. And the goal for that was for those men to go in and locate the armory. Once they would locate this room, the armory was a place where they would stockpile weapons. A lot of gunpowder in that room. And all they'd have to do is light a match and destroy that city from the inside out. This is one of the enemy's very favorite tactics is he goes, go ahead, let your soul hang on to bitterness. Let it hang on to unforgiveness. You know, like a bomb, those things, I made those weapons and they are very unstable and over time they begin to corrode and they get volatile and you end up biting somebody's head off that you didn't intend to. You didn't want your anger to go that direction, but guess what? You can't control it because that weapon was made for a different cause and for a different outcome. And as believers, we have to get to the place where we recognize the enemy is going, I don't care what kind of life you create on the surface if I have access because you hold on to these things that are sin to hold on to, all I have to do is light a match and I can destroy you from the inside out. Because you're holding on to something that was created for wicked intent. You know, years ago, we had a big piece of property, uh, a ranch, and right down the street, one of our neighbors came to us and he said, you better watch out. We have these people from this oil company that have shown up, and he said, I want to show you what they did to my yard. So we go down, look at his yard. He has this big, beautiful house with this wraparound porch, and it looks down over a hill at a beautiful lake, and right in front of his porch is this huge steel grasshopper pulling oil out of the ground, creaking, loud, noisy. He said it, it goes 24-7, and it's totally blocked the view of my lake. So now when I sit out there with my cop, coffee, I hate, I hate this, and there's nothing I can do because I didn't own the mineral rights. I only own what's on the surface. That hit me just like that. And God said, Amy, this is what's happening to my children, is they're building on the surface, and they think all is good. I have a great view. I have great potential. And the enemy's going, but I own what's underneath. You've got anger. You've got bitterness. You've got resentment. And it doesn't matter what you do on the surface. I can come up because of my rights to what's underneath and destroy everything you've built. And that's his pleasure. He doesn't mind you building a great life, especially if it's at the expense of eternity. 
He doesn't mind you being financially blessed. If that's gonna keep your attention and you're gonna be standing in the Gucci line store for eight hours on Saturday so that you can get in, then he's like, good, that's good time spent. No eternity connected to that. He doesn't mind you being blessed as long as it doesn't last, as long as its seed is not eternal. So we cannot defeat what we allow. And what Jesus showed us through these three temptations and how they connect to spiritual warfare is this, you empower what you give preference to. What do you prefer in your life? Does your body come first, your needs? Because this is what I want you to see is when the body and soul come first, the spirit is pushed to the background and the spirit will not elbow its way in. It will not push its own way. Its natural tendency is to surrender because it's, it's created to surrender to Christ, to be nothing without being connected. But this is what happens when, when the body and soul you know, are fighting for territory and the spirit is in the background. But what happens when the spirit is in charge? When your spirit's in charge, it brings wholeness. Remember what Hebrew is in three. Hebrew is a picture of the image of God. It's a picture of how we were created in his image and the word is wholeness, it's harmony. And when the spirit is put in charge, your soul and your body come into alignment where your body is restored and your soul is redeemed and you get to a place where everything then about you that can live forever will. You get a new body, your soul becomes a part of what God does with eternity, your gifts, your callings, your talents, they can live forever because there's purpose connected. Your spirit uppermost, that's how I call it, when your spirit's in charge, when your spirit's the boss, your spirit won't force its way. This is why it's so important for you to put your flesh in its place. We're gonna cover more next week about the armor of God, but the armor of God is so that we can resist, so we can stand. And the goal for us is just to stand and watch God deliver, but we have to move the battle to where we're not fighting the enemy in a place where he's created all the weapons and the territory's familiar to him. We need to take the battle and give it to the Lord. And how we do that is by taking the battle to the spirit. Romans 8, 5 says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. How do we empower the spirit? By disempowering our flesh through fasting, through prayer, through giving, through surrendering, doing opposite of what we naturally do in the flesh. Can I challenge you for your homework this week to do that? The way you'd naturally react or respond, can you stop yourself and rein in that flesh and go, wait a minute, I wanna do this, but it hasn't been working for me. I'm on a cycle I'd like to break. I'm losing this battle. It's time for us to take the battle to a higher dimension for eternity. I want you to try something different, to change the game on the enemy. You know, eagles are beautiful things, and it's an, quite an amazing thing to see. I, when I was a young girl, we were driving from our location on Old Denton Drive back home to where we lived off Trinity Mills, and we saw this huge eagle carrying this snake, this enormous snake flying right over the, the hood of our car. And I remember seeing that and I said, mom, do birds eat snakes? And she said, yes. What they do though, is they, they grab them on the ground, but they don't fight them on the ground. They take them up to the sky where their territory is familiar, where the snake has no ground. It has no rights, it has no traction. They take them up to the, a different dimension and shake them and break them. And this is the word of God for you right now. You're losing because you're fighting the enemy on his territory. It's time for you to step up, to rise up to the spiritual realm and fix the problem at a higher place. It can be done, you know, 
At growing up, I never really understood fasting in a way that I felt a personal conviction about it. I think because I was fasting something that really didn't cost me anything. In the past couple of weeks, when I saw the hand of God, He was moving and, and things, something was shifting, and I felt as a leader, do I need to step in and have a conversation? Or do I need my flesh needs to stay out of this and God, you handle it? And that's a fine line because you can't not be diligent with something that God's given you and just let it go forever, right? But I was at this critical place and I said to my husband, I, it's, we've been praying, it's time to fast. And what God asked me to fast was humorous to me because I didn't realize that that one thing was my go-to for happiness, for joy. Not that I don't have joy in the Holy Ghost, I do, but whenever I wanted just that little jolt, that emotional, you know, I would go do this. And it wasn't sinful, it was just fun. And you know, it was a little more than 24 hours and God shifted that whole situation and took care of it for me. And I recognized that when I did that, just pulling back my flesh, saying, Amy, you're a leader, you can do this, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right now, the Holy Spirit doesn't need your brain, it doesn't need your mind, it needs your surrender. Scoot back, give me space, and let me do this thing. When we grow the Spirit, we empower the Spirit at the expense of the flesh. And this is what I want you to see that is absolutely so empowering. Is the enemy, he wants us to throw ourselves down, to wrestle in the mud with him over things that don't matter. I felt picked on. The last few days I felt antagonized by the enemy and I leaned over to my husband this morning and I said, I am not letting him steal one minute. He's trying to get under my skin because he, he sees the giant that I'm called to. And this is why he keeps trying to push buttons. I know you've got but buttons too. Opinions that matter to you. Wins that you want in your favor. And the enemy wants us to throw ourselves down and get into arguments online and, and handle things through the flesh and, and engage with him down here because down here, he's yet to be defeated. But he is defeated up here. In the spirit realm, his days are over. We're seeing him decay and he's running out the clock, but he's a defeated foe. And if you take him back to the realm where he's lost all authority and all power, then it's easy to win that battle. Maybe you've been striving in the natural to try to bring reconciliation, or you've been working in the flesh, trying to find your purpose and your calling, and God is saying the answers to all of those things is not down here in the mud. Come out, bring the enemy with you, take him to a place, change the battlefield, take him to a place of discomfort, make him extremely uncomfortable, shake him and break him. He doesn't have power over you unless you allow it. He can't destroy you unless you co-sign. So the strongest teaching I can give you on spiritual warfare is not to focus on some Shonda Baha something off in the ethereal wonder and, and neglect the battle right at home. This is where you gain authority. In, the, in this place, the secret place, God sees in secret and rewards openly. And his desire is to reward you for the secret things. Would you stand with me, please? The prayer that I, I feel to pray this morning is a prayer of surrender. You know, Friday night at the women's event, I've gotten so many reports from women who we prayed a corporate prayer from women who received the Holy Spirit. It isn't our spirit that overcomes, but we live on this side in the New Testament, this side of the cross. You know what that means for us? Is the, the first spiritual warfare context in the Old Testament was when Daniel, he, he, he was visited by an angel and the angel said to him, 
On the first day you pray, prayed and fasted, I was sent with your answer. But for 21 days, I have been embattled by the Prince of Persia, this principality that's kept me from bringing your answer. That gives us a picture of spiritual warfare, but that gives us a picture of spiritual warfare before the cross. Before the cross, it was us down here and the enemy right over our head and then God's up there. But after he wrapped himself in flesh, Jesus' spirit is God's spirit. That's how he's all man and all God. And God wrapped himself in flesh and put himself in a position to where he could gain authority in this realm to hand it over to you and I. So that when we step into our identity in Christ, that Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God battles for us, then our enemy, he is sandwiched between heavenly places and between the Holy Spirit down here. And his days are numbered. But we've been given authority through the blood of Jesus Christ to overcome. The end of the book in Revelation says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. You have a testimony of overcoming because you've been through some things and God is for you. You've never been embattled because you did something wrong. You're embattled because you've done something right. You're embattled because you carry something for this age and this generation. The enemy's fighting you. He's an ancient foe. Why would he waste his time on you if what you had to bring to the table did not make a difference? If it did not matter, he would leave you alone. But his work is to disappoint you before your day of appointment. I wanna cause you to engage in the wrong fight so that you lose the war. And you and I, as believers, have to say, you know what? I've let my flesh, my body, my soul away with too much. And it's time for me to put my spirit back in charge. And I do that by surrendering to the Holy Spirit. And the work of the Holy Spirit is perfect. You know, you may be scared of the Holy Spirit. You're like, I don't wanna speak in tongues and flop on the floor. You know what the Holy Spirit really does? Is the Holy Spirit just doesn't make you run laps and speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit, covers your mouth, makes you repent and live right. The Holy Spirit holds you accountable. The Holy Spirit has a plan for you. The Holy Spirit wants to empower your spirit. And the prayer that I feel to pray today for each of our campuses, those of you online and here in Carrollton, is a prayer that God will speak a very specific through the gift of the Holy Spirit word over your life for what your next step is. The cry of your heart right now is, God, I want to empower my spirit. Years ago when I was a teenager, I looked in the mirror and the Holy Spirit asked me, Amy, if you could see your spirit in this mirror, what would your spirit look like? And I remember at that day and age, you know, we were seeing commercials about Ethiopian children that were starving. And that was, we we're seeing that a lot on TV. And that's the image that I saw of my spirit because I wasn't feeding my spirit. I wasn't empowering my spirit. My spirit was starving. And after God gave me that picture, he began to give me next steps for how to empower my spirit. And it always came at a price to my flesh. Every time. And you know, as I've walked through the seasons of my life, anytime I've been put in a very hard position where I didn't really want to submit, the Holy Spirit would say, Amy, submission doesn't count if you agree. Submission doesn't count if it was your idea. Submission counts when it costs. And every time I would have to submit to a hard situation, I would go, there's another eternal decision I made right here. My spirit's just gotten stronger. My spirit, again, when I put down my flesh, I don't say what I wanna say, I don't have to share my opinion, my spirit just grew. When I close my mouth and I only say words of life and not death, my spirit just grew. God wants to show you the next steps because the enemy, it's very small in ways that he can sneak in, he's cunning and he wants to deceive you into not taking authority over your own territory. 
And when we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're talking about this territory right here. God, have your kingdom come here. And Jesus looked at them and said, my kingdom is here. It's within you. I want the kingdom of God to spread, but it's got to start right here. I have, my authority begins right here. And that goes for all of us. Let's pray right now a prayer of agreement that we will hear the voice of God. Father, I thank you right now that your spirit, the voice of many waters, you are, you are overshadowing your people right now. God, I thank you for prophetic pictures. I thank you for dreams for visions. God, I thank you for words of wisdom and words of knowledge, words that see through things and words that see us through. God, I thank you right now that you are empowering your children as our desire, leaning towards your spirit is to yield to you and not be a victim of our circumstance or of the enemy who desires to destroy our legacy and our soul. But Father, right now, we lean into what you're doing by the Spirit. We don't want to be taken off guard. We don't want to be finding out about things as those who have no covenant are, but we want to be ahead of what you're doing, prepared for the harvest of what you're bringing. And we thank you, Father, right now, that you are speaking gently but clearly about what we need to do to disempower our flesh and empower our spirit. We thank you, Father, that we commit right now to be obedient and true to your word. If you speak to us, we will not turn away and forget what you said, but we will be faithful to activate the word that's been given today. We ask for your blessing, God, on the seed. Water the seed of your word, that it would not return void, but that it will be accomplish exactly what it was sent to accomplish. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. We give you a praise in advance for every victory that will be won because of this shift in Jesus' name. We thank you for it right now. Let's give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah. God is good. How often is he good? All the time he's good. Amen. Well, if there's anyone here in this house that would like to give their heart to Jesus, now you know what you're giving to him. You're giving him your mind, your will, and your emotions saying, God, not my will, but yours. If that is you, I want every head bowed, please, and eyes closed. We're about to close the service, but before we do, we have to do this. This is the most eternal decision anyone can make. Your your spirit's gonna live forever. It's just a matter of where your spirit will live. And if you want to be born again, as the Bible calls it, by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd love to invite you to just raise your hand all over the building, wherever you are. We're not gonna embarrass you. I'm just gonna pray this prayer together with you. I see those hands. We wanna pray it together. I see that hand, yes. More importantly, God sees these hands right now. If you could hear the shout of heaven right now that is coming forth, we're gonna do something together. The Bible says that all you have to do is believe in your heart that Jesus came for you, that he died a brutal death and he rose again on the third day. That's all you have to do, believe in your heart and declare with your mouth. And right now we're gonna pray this prayer together. I see hands all over the room. If you're watching online, you can click the button, raise your hand and pray this prayer with us. Let's say this, Father God, I thank you for sending your son as a sacrifice for my sin. I receive him now. Jesus, come into my heart, into my soul and make me clean. Thank you for your sacrifice. I receive you now as Lord and Savior. And with these words, I believe I am saved. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand today? There were hands all over this room. Woo! I know heaven's doing a good job celebrating. Yeah! All right, so if you were saved today in this service or watching online, please text us the words I am saved to 41411 so we can get resources in your hand. 
Uh, we want to walk with the devotional, walk you through the next seven days. Uh, we'd love to be there for you. We won't bother you, but we would love to just be um, an ally and support for you in this new journey. And congratulations again. Before we close this morning, I want to give you an opportunity. I was on the phone uh, the last couple days with a pastor friend who's flown into Ukraine, and he is right in the middle of where all the refugees right on the border are coming to try to get out. And I want you to see some of these pictures because the testimony is phenomenal. Israel has been getting resources into Ukrainian Jews through a secret network system. And what has happened that's transpired that's really miraculous is that the local church and the pastors, the churches are being flooded with refugees and they're turning the whole church into a place where they can sleep. They're hoping that Russia will not bomb churches, that it's the safest place to be. And we're praying that for sure. And we're gonna agree together in a second. Um, but these refugees are coming from hundreds of miles with just one little bag and the clothes on their back and they're hungry. They don't have food, they don't have water. And so we're working with what's beautiful is the, the unification of these Israeli Jews working with local pastors to bring resources to people. And we have boots on the ground right now. There's little small tents that they're buying that they're setting up inside gymnasiums so families can feel safe together, especially if they have babies that can sleep. And uh, money for food, for clothing, for warm clothing and for lodging. And so if you'd like to make a difference, um, I'm gonna ask you to give this morning and um, go to the app if you wanna give. And on the app, we have a, a little section that says global missions. All you have to do is click that and everything given to that tab will go straight to Ukraine. And we will send those funds in the next 24 hours. So we would love to invite you to be a part of that. Um, this is not going through some out agency that we don't know where it's going. It's going straight to these pastors in need. And we'll be able to give you, I know, lots of testimonies of what God is doing. As we do that this morning, can we pray, agree together right now and pray? You know, our battle is not with flesh and blood, but against principalities. And there's a big principality in that region. And we want to take authority in the spirit. We wanna see the hand of God, amen, do you agree? So let's agree right now and pray for Ukraine. Father, we thank you that your presence just invade. Your word says that you are near to the brokenhearted. And we thank you, Father, right now that as we are able to meet the physical needs, the door is swinging open for many to come to know you. God, we thank you right now that as they are blessed, by churches and by leaders, they're gonna see that you, God, are for them. God, we thank you right now that we have through your name, as we face the Goliath in the valley right now, not through our own authority, but we take authority and we rebuke the enemy that has come against Ukraine. God, we thank you, Father, and we ask God that Russians will rise to judge their own leadership in Jesus' name that they take care of this and they confront this spiritual issue in Jesus' name. God, I thank you that you're gonna empower the righteous right now, that there will be a transference of wealth from the wicked to the righteous in Jesus' name. God, we ask that as the enemy comes in, that like a flood, you raise up a standard against him. Father, we're asking you for miracles, signs and wonders right now in Jesus' name. God, show yourself, Jesus, show yourself strong to the suffering in Jesus name. We commit to pray for our brothers and sisters, God, and we thank you, God, that you're a perfect father that provides and protects. We call your name in regard to Ukraine. God's will will be done. We will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, amen, amen. We believe it, keep praying for it. We're gonna see breakthrough. I'm gonna bless you as we go. I'll be teaching next Sunday. We're gonna go into the armor of God and the other tactics of the enemy. I hope you learned something that will help you today overcome. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace and may he cover you with his name, Jesus. Good day and God bless you.